Welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. It is Friday on this show, so we're going to jump right into our conversation with Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. Then a JT Mitchell, News Director for Super Talk Mississippi News, will be joining me in the second half of the show, and we'll highlight the news of the week. Anyway, Jeff, how you doing, my friend? Doing great, Ricky. Great to hear from you. A uh, beautiful day over in New Orleans, and um, yeah, it's been a been a good spring so far over here. Yeah, it has. It has. Listen, uh, we're going to do a couple things real quick. Um, I want to get the latest on the book, uh, the Steve Gleason book that you co-authored. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about some, what, what the events are and how it's being received. We're going to talk about the Saints schedule that was just released. And then we'll look back at, this, at the uh, Ricky Minicamp that just got finished. Some really cool headlines coming from that. So let's, uh, let's start with the book. How are things going, my friend? Well, we're in the middle of the publicity tour, so it's kind of fun right now. We're getting all the rewards for all the work, you know, of two, two and a half years of our lives. So, uh, it's been great. We've been out locally, uh, with our local booksellers and lining up new events down the road and just getting a lot of positive feedback from, uh, from readers and people that have been, uh, waiting to read this book. So it's been, been great so far. Hey, listen, uh, let me give you a belated happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. I saw the post that Steve did, and one of the pictures he posted, of course, he was incredibly thankful to have you as a friend and a writing writing partner, and he alluded to that. But one of the pictures he shared, I think it it told it helped, told a hell of a story. I'm assuming that that's the kitchen table at Steve's house, and Michelle on one end of the table, Steve on the other end, and you in the middle, and you got your computers up, and you guys are apparently involved in a writing session. But, you know, that's that's what people don't see, sort of that behind-the-scenes view of you guys collaborating around this book. Is that what that was? Yeah, that was their dining room tables where we did a lot of the book work uh, in those exact same positions, <laughs> night after night, day after day. And, uh, yeah, that was um, that was us collaborating. That was late in the process, though. I do remember that was a long day over there. But, yeah, it was definitely a team effort. And, uh, you know, Steve and Michelle are both incredible writers themselves. So it was really fun to collaborate with them. And over time, we found a synergy. Uh, You know, you bring three people together with three different writing styles. You're trying to write in Steve's voice. So we all had to kind of learn his rhythm and prose. And uh, by, I'd say, halfway through the book, we, we had it down pretty good. Well, listen, he gave you, he, again, he gave you a lot of credit for keeping him on task and challenging uh, him. Of course, we had a, you know, folks who are regular listeners of this show, they they know from the last couple of years that you shared sort of, you know, bits and pieces of your writing journey with Steve. Um, you know, when, when you got hung up a, a, a couple of times and when you found, found uh, incredible, you know, forks in the road that told some amazing stories, but, uh, but you each had a role. Michelle had a particular important role. Steve, of course, had an, an important role. But you as a writing partner, you had an important role. And Steve gives you a lot of credit for that. It's great to see, you know, coming out of a, of a painful process, process like that, that you guys, you know, there's love there, you know? Oh, yeah. There's no question that we grew closer because of the project. And I know that, uh, you know, he, he would describe it. He'd use the analogy. It feels like he's jumping out of a plane without a parachute when he started this book project. And I, I get that, that, you know, trepidation. Uh, but if you know Steve, the way he's wired, and we've talked about this a lot in the program, I mean, he's going to jump anyway. <laughs> he's not going to be scared. That's just, uh, Sean Payton used a, a, a analogy once to describe Steve. He said, he's the guy when you're out with your buddies on a canoe trip and you're in a river and all of a sudden there's a big waterfall up ahead and you all pull over and dock your canoes and you look over the side at the waterfall and you see the pool below and everybody's wondering how deep that water is. Steve's the guy that jumps, you know, <laughs> without wondering, he's just going for it. And that is so true. And I saw that in the book project, Steve would encounter moments or challenges or maybe fear. And he just embraces it and runs to it and then gets yeah. to the other side of it. What an inspiration! What you get? You got a big event coming up in Washington D.C., man. I mean, that's that's really going to be a cool event, isn't it? Yeah, next week up at Capitol Hill, and we're going to meet with uh, a lot of the Louisiana legislative leaders up there, and um, have a chance to 
share some some readings uh, from the book and then also visit with them about ALS Awareness Month, which is this month, and try and get some some new legislation passed for people that are still fighting the disease and living with the disease. Uh, so it's going to be a really great event. Looking forward to James Carville and Mary Matlin are going to come introduce us at the session. Of course, they live, you know, they have part-time residents down in the Gulf Coast over in Bay St. Louis. And um, yeah, it's just going to be a great event. We've got, we've got a lot of uh, excitement building for that. We've been talking about it for about six months. Yeah, uh, Tony Kornheiser will yes. be there. Yeah, Tony Kornheiser, who people might not remember, the longtime columnist of the Washington Post, but he had a stint there for a while when he joined ESPN where he was the color analyst for Monday Night Football. And he was actually the color analyst on the dome coming game when Steve blocked the punt against the Falcons in 2006. And if you remember that broadcast, uh, Ricky, they went silent after the block punt for 34 seconds on a network broadcast. <clears throat> That's a lifetime in network TV to not say a word but they let the power of the moment take over. It was brilliant, brilliant decision by Tariko and Kornheiser. And if you go back and watch the the replay of that, it's it's a very powerful scene. I'll have to go back. I remember seeing it not long after that, because of course I was in the dome when, when that occurred. And as you and I have discussed before, I, I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that. And I probably will never experience anything like that again in the Superdome. It was just electric because of the significance of the moment and coming back to the super dome and the black kick and the way the crowd, it was just like everyone was in tune together emotionally at the same time. And it was so loud and so amazing. Um, but I'll have to go back and take a look at that. Anything else about the book, Jeff? No, no, the, look, we're, we're going to try and get down to the Gulf coast soon. We, we will definitely be, I think I've said before at the Mississippi book festival in Jackson, Mississippi, that's in September. They've moved kind of the date to the fall now. We're really looking forward to that event, but we need to get down to the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and I know that's uh, going to be on the itinerary. When we get those details, certainly we'll announce it here first and foremost. Very good. As I mentioned, my friend Rick Carter uh, from the Island View and I have talked, and, and he would uh, love to host a, a book signing there. Of course, they're equipped to do it because they've got the resources to, to be able to do it and handle it, as you learned when you did your book signing there as well. Uh, hey, listen, uh, we'll get to the, uh, the, the Ricky mini camp here in just a second, but the schedule has been released. Um, first game, we need to win it. We probably will win it against Carolina Panthers, but then it gets super dang tough, man. And as you guys wrote, um, but we're going to hit the ground running this year, aren't we? Yeah, this is the maybe most challenging front-loaded schedule I've seen in a while. All the really difficult games are in the first half of the season. So if the Saints can survive that and come out of that in, you know, 500, I think, uh, they'll be in good position, I think, to finish strong. But, man, it is a murder's row after they play Carolina here. You go to Dallas, then you have the Philadelphia Eagles in week three, at Atlanta, you know, your longtime rivals who picked to win the division. Uh, then you got to go to Kansas City, the defending Super Bowl champs, on Monday Night Football <laughs> in prime time at Arrowhead Stadium, an incredibly difficult environment. Uh, and then you're going to get Sean Payton coming here in week seven after you play the Tampa Bay Bucks on a Thursday night. Uh, you know Sean. I, I know him very well. He's going to have that team ready to play that guy. I can guarantee you that. Uh, I was texting him earlier in the week about this uh, about this game, and uh, yeah, it's going to be circled on the calendar out in Denver. I can tell you that. And then the uh, the Chargers and Carolina, it gets it gets better, it gets well not better, but let's say it gets easier in the second half. But you know they just got to survive the first part of the season. When I saw it, man, I started reading through the list, and I'm like, holy mackerel, man! They better they better be ready for prime time because it's going to be a it's going to be really tough. Um, well, what I think is interesting, Ricky, is, you know, it's a pivotal year for Dennis Allen. It's year three, hasn't had the success he's won the first two years. He's got to get buy-in quickly with this team. And I think it's going to be difficult if you don't have success on the field. So for him trying to galvanize this team and, and get the leadership on board, uh, he's going to be challenged as a head coach with those games because they could play well in those games and still lose. Uh, Dallas, you can make an argument, Dallas 
Philadelphia and Kansas City are three of the top five teams in the league. So um, to me, that's going to be the real interesting thing to see. If they get out of the gate one and four or something, uh, can they keep it going? Can they keep things together given the lack of success they've had coming into this year? You know, speaking of Sean Payton uh, for the Denver Broncos, who's going to start as quarterback for them? Oh, I don't think anybody knows. I mean, it's still way too early. I mean, Bo Nix, I'm sure, is going to get a chance to. They draft him the first round for a reason, but they have Jared Stidham there as well, and I know the, the staff's been high on him. He's kind of a, a, a stopgap, I think, until Bo Nix is ready, but everything you hear is that, you know, Bo Nix is the guy. It's just, I mean, we're one week into the offseason. There's just no way to... No, that all play out in training camp. So interesting how two former Auburn guys end up together on that team. That's that's so interesting to me. Yeah. Um, hey, listen, when we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Jeff Duncan. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. I have Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times Picayune with me today, as I do every single Friday. And uh, we were having a chat uh, in the uh, during the break about Bo Nix and about Spencer Rattler, and my gut tells me that Spencer Rattler is a better quarterback than Bo Nix, but Jeff just laughs and says, what What? What do you base that on? <laughs> I said, well, I mean, just let's, gut, let's just let's gut. Let's see what happens. This is the time of year when everybody's, the hype train is, uh, you know, unimpeded. Uh, you know, I've seen this happen a million times. You know, the, the fresh new toy, uh, we'll see how it plays out. But uh, look, I, they, they drafted Spencer Rattler, for a reason. I mean, they obviously liked him. They had a high grade on him. So let's let's see how the young kid, uh, you know, plays out. Uh, obviously, he had a lot of talent and was the number one high school prospect in America for a while. Uh, so there's a re- you know there's talent there. There's no question. Hey, listen, um, we'll come, we'll get back to the uh, the rookie minicamp. But one of the interesting things that's sort of rolling out of the rookie minicamp is the, the access to our new offensive coordinator. And conversations, and you know, I think speculation about <clears throat> how he's going to use Alvin Kamara, and is he going to how, how he might use Taysom Hill. He's got some great weapons, and he's seen, you know you're not going to get a he's not a rah rah kind of guy, but but there's he seems to have some confidence about what he has to work with, doesn't he? Yeah, look, the, the Saints have certainly competitive weapons, you know, with Hill and Kamara. I mean, I think Kamara is going to be an interesting guy to watch because his numbers have really dropped off the last couple of years. And it's hard to tell how much of that is him just in his career, you know, getting older and how much of it was maybe, you know, the offensive line not playing that well or the scheme. Uh, so I think there's going to be a added focus on Alvin Kamara this year to see if he's still got, got it. You know, I mean, his numbers, analytically are way down and it's not just that they weren't blocking i mean you know his numbers when they factor those things in they have analytics still aren't very high so i think getting the running game is a top priority they got to get that going they got to improve it they want to take pressure off of Derek carr that's the way to do it and uh it all starts up front though and that's why they you know they drafted taliese wanga with the first pick i mean they got to get better up front and this guy, I mean, he looks the part. I'll say that. He definitely is not, he doesn't look like a guy that's going to take a lot of time to step right into a starting role. And, you know, it's interesting. I mean, by the way, the interviews I've seen with Fuanga is he is extremely mature. You can just tell he's not a, he's not a fat guy. He is a tough guy. I mean, you can tell that he's got muscle and and of course, he plays mean and all that. But man, they right off the bat put him at, at left uh, left tackle, and um, they're gonna. I mean, they're playing serious ball. I mean, here here you got a rookie. He's 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 used to right tackle, and day one they put him at left tackle. What's your read on all that? Well, I think they're just trying to get a look at him. This is the time to do it. Uh, I'm I'm a little different in this approach, Ricky. I think like you just get your five best. Lyman and and you'll be fine. I think we overanalyze sometimes positions and where you've played. Yes, there are some nuances and sophistications that go with switching over from right to left. But I can remember Jamal Brown coming into the Saints. Uh, it was won the Outland Trophy at Oklahoma. It was an elite tackle, and they played him on the right side early in his career. And then he eventually went back to left, and he was fine at both of them. I mean, these big athletic. Guys like that, they'll be fine. I, I, I have no doubt he can play left tackle. 
I think he'll probably end up at right tackle because I think Trevor Penning's going to end up being the left tackle. But I think you get your five best big guys and go with that. Yeah, you don't see you don't see the antsiness <clears throat> related as long as Trevor Penning stays healthy. You don't see the antsiness around him. There's a I, I don't say growing confidence. But you have a sense that he might actually step into that role this year and play the way he was expected to play when he came out of college. We picked up a 30-year-old lineman, but if I've seen some tape on him. It's really good, and he's a leader. So, you know, they they seem to be making some good moves. Yeah, well, I mean, they've got to get better up front. That's, I mean, this new scheme ain't going to meet Matt to Hill of Beans if they can't block. I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Your X's and O's are only so good. I mean, you got to be able to block people. And that's really, to me, the key to this entire offseason and their entire new offensive approach is can they get better up front? Because the X's and O's don't don't matter. I mean, the, the Saints are bringing in a new scheme, but this isn't in, in some kind of, like, wonder drug, you know? I mean, like, it, it, the teams are running all of the league, and you got to have players to run it. So, you know, the Saints will only get go as far as their execution of what they're running and that's where Kubiak and the new staff are going to have to step in and the leaders of the offense and hold each other accountable and, and improve as the year goes on. It's just basic uh, coaching, basically, and they've got to get better in that area. And I'm sure that's why Dennis Allen made the change on that side of the ball. He, he knows they've got to get better. Listen, uh, one of the things that's been talked about a lot is Kubiak using a more simplified language around play calling and someone made the point I was watching an analysis of how Kubiak approaches it versus say how Gruden John Gruden approaches it when you're watching these quarter QB sessions that he used to have and he would you know do a play call it's like I don't know how many you know 10 15 words long I yep. think how hard that is for a young guy to understand the nuances of that and then you realize you start to understand how it's how a place can break down and, so, and have miscommunication and problems in a in a play call kubiak wants to he doesn't want the play the name of the call and the way they play name uh, the, the way they call the play to be a factor they tra he's trying to take that out of the confusion of the nfl um that's smart yeah it's good coaching i, I consider that and look, that's different terminology, different language. Uh, everybody's going to have to learn that. Uh, but, you know, there's no doubt the old Sean Payton, John Gruden offensive system was infamous for how complicated it was and how long it was. But it also was very successful. I mean, the most successful offensive scheme the Saints have ever had. So we'll see if it translates. Yeah, so you're you're seeing some interesting characters that are emerging, Kool-Aid and Bub. Um, you know, what was your read on, on watching those guys in action? Well, I mean, it's, they're just trying to figure out where the, you know, where the bathroom is down the hallway right now. So, I mean, it's hard to get a real gauge on it, but you get a chance to see these guys on the hoof for the first time and see them up close and kind of see their personalities. And I was actually watching the coaching staff more than anything else, seeing how they operate, how they coach, how they teach. And we'll get a really good feel once the veterans get in here. Uh, next week and we'll, we'll see them the first OTAs together and see how, you know, who's the alphas, who's the ones that are, that look, you know, look the part and aren't overwhelmed by the, the stage or the veteran presence of, of these guys they grew up watching on TV. So it's going to be, it's always fun to watch this time of year. And I actually think this backup quarterback competition is going to be really fun to watch. I know everybody's caught up in Spencer Rattler right now, but I'm, I'm not counting out Jay Kaner. Hey, listen, it's interesting that you point out. You, of course, you've got Kubiak in his first role as an offensive coordinator, a new team around him. He's excited about his team. What did you observe in how they were interacting with each other? Is the is the Kubiak y'all saw on the field different than what we see when he grants interviews? No, no, he's definitely more of a teacher. He's a lot like Sean Payton. Sean Payton was a, a real teacher. He wasn't a yeller at practice. He was more of a teacher. Uh, I have heard that Kubiak's very good in the room in front of the team, in front of the offense, uh, very thorough, uh, you know, very confident. Uh, so he's a little different, say, in front of the team than he is in, in front of a camera. Well, he, he's, he'll be the first to tell you. I mean, he's not a big media guy. He's not, he doesn't like the media. He just, he just he wants to do ball. That's what he is. He's a ball coach. Got, got a new offensive uh, line coach. We got all, all, the, all the offensive guys are new. Uh, you know, anything interesting in that group that you see? 
No, I mean, look, those are veteran guys. Rick Dennison and John Benton. I mean, those guys have been around the block. So I think it'll be refreshing for a guy like Trevor Pinning, who's a reclamation project, have a new set of eyes and ears, a new way of doing things. Uh, he can get a fresh start there. I, I really think Trevor Pinning is going to be fine. You know, they're going to he's going to struggle against the elite pass rushers, but they'll have a plan to help him, just like they did last year. And I, I think the reason he got drafted so high, he's got a, a immense talent. It's just a matter of can he get it done. You know, uh, when the live bullets are fired. On the defensive side of the ball, we, you know, a lot of speculation about whether Marshawn Lattimore would be traded away. It doesn't appear that that's going to happen. We got a great defensive backfield, and the opportunities that it might create for us to allow, say, a free safety to to be able to roam a little bit. Um, we've got some shutdown corners now, don't we? Yeah, that's the strength of the defense is the cornerback position. That's actually why I think you know Lattimore is expendable. I mean, they've got they've got if you look at the numbers last year, Ricky, when Lattimore didn't play, the secondary was better than it was when he played. You know, the the quarterback rating was was worse against the backup. So they've got depth there. I, I still think it's possible that they move him in, in camp. It's more financially feasible for them to do it then. And you just don't know if a, a contending team has a veteran go down and they desperate and they think they're a, a corner away from making a Super Bowl run. I could see that happening. Just, man, they, it, they're in a good position there, that's for sure. There's no doubt about that. Listen, Jeff, it's been great to catch up with you, my friend. Yeah, Ricky, we'll talk next week, man, and we'll have a better observation once we get the veterans in there next week talk about what we're seeing. That'd be cool. Very good. Thanks for keeping in touch with us. Listen, when we come back, JT Mitchell from Super Talk Mississippi News will be joining us. 